it started too late for a lot of fellows. Yeah. Most of the fellows I work with are all dead now. I was in the bank about two months ago, and there was four ladies that was pension check day, and four ladies were cashing their checks. They were all widows, and their husbands had died from asbestosis. You don't realize it at the time, but, you know, one this week and one the next week, and in the end, uh, it shows up. When you work in the refineries, on the average day, you might get 10 different smells going through. So you say to each other, well, I wonder what we're breathing this time, because you don't have any idea where those smells are coming from, or what's leaking, or whether it's supposed to be there or not. sometime. Hi, I'm uh, Ross Tias, business manager for Local 663, uh, United Association of Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, Welders and Apprentices, and this is Labor Day of 2009. Labor Day has been an event and a tradition here since 1954. This is probably the most labor-intensive area per capita in North America. When you think about all the unions and what they created for people, and the fact that we have holidays and the fact that we're not making three dollars an hour for everybody across the board labor day is our christmas
parents had divorced when I was younger, so my mom uh, purchased a house of her own in a very small little village, and uh, she worked at a factory in London, and the factory went on strike for six months. Well, my mom was gonna lose the house uh, and lose everything. So rather than her lose everything, I left high school and got a job to uh, be the income. The only job I could get at the time was uh, working for a big turkey farm company. And I worked in what they called the black gang because of how dirty you would get in a day. You were paid uh, eight hours pay a day and you usually worked 12 hour days. Uh, you would catch turkeys all day and then you would clean the barns at night. It wasn't the greatest job, it was very low pay because I didn't have my grade 12 and anything, but that's about as much as I could get at the time. A gentleman who was uh, uh, dating my mom at the time uh, was from down here. He was actually a uh, company owner down here. He said, why don't you come to Sarnia with me and uh, we'll see if we can find you a job. since 1980. I was 17 years old when I moved down to this area. Uh, my father was a mechanic. I had very little interest in that. I think I do okay as a boilermaker. Sarnia is like regular blue collar, sort of working class town. A classic rock, beer drinking, denim jeans, baseball cap, kind of a town. It's not necessarily a bad place, but to me it has a feeling of being sort of cast in bronze. I certainly feel like I don't fit in here. 
I mean, I do my best, I guess, to keep the peace, so to speak, but I, you know, I feel like I can't really enter in so much to the, what little culture of this city there is. I spend my time, if I'm not at work, just uh, working on music. People, I think, a lot of the time, they like to hear beautiful sounds, but I feel like ugly sounds or mundane sounds you know, the sound of somebody doing dishes or whatever, to me, they're just as important as a scale on the piano. I mean, you wouldn't see the suffering just to look at the city. I just feel like there's a different kind of suffering here. My name is Dennis Crockford, but I'm originally not from here. I'm from England, but I've done a lot of studying of what happened and how this became the town it is. This is one of the most important parts here. This is the uh, Lawrence room. Now the Lawrence family goes back, you're gonna fall off your chair, 55 BC. We have the old records in here of that family of the lords, the ladies, and everything else. Here's the history of the Lawrence family, which is the oldest family that I know that came from the old country to here. That's as far as I know. The name of Sarnia is from the Channel Islands, that's where the name was taken and used for Sarnia. One of the big organizations that came here first was the Lawrence family. They had the Lawrence Lumber Company here, and they brought all the timbers down here, and they were all done here in Sarnia. Sarnia really started as it is today during the war, World War II. An Allied Chemical Company came here, and then during the first part of the war, 
polymer started up making rubber and then Dow Chemical followed in but Imperial Law was here before them and then uh, Shell came from Petrolia and they came here in 1952 and Sun came here around about the same time and another plant that was here was fiberglass and uh, the people that worked there got it bad on their chest. There's not too many surviving today that work there. This will give you a pretty fair idea of the history of Sarnia. And this was put out by Shell. This is a chemical industry, and you might as well say that's it. You don't get much anything else coming here anymore, apart from to do with chemicals. Something like that. That's what that's what you do. That's what you're looking at today. Okay, let's go. Wait, wait now. Stay, stay. Let's just hold on to that. He's ready to go now. All right, let's go. Where you go? Whoop. Hey, don't go through the garden. Go down this way. <laughs> Come on. We go through this walk every day around this time. This here's this here's Jake, this is Cleo, and that's Caesar. Watch that bus. I had a big family, and uh, I just believe the proper way for people to live is to help one another, especially those that are less fortunate. I try to do what I can in my own community, and I have for the last 45 years. I've tried to be a, a community worker. I do a lot of work with uh, Canadian diabetes. Uh, I do what I can help, whatever I can do to help make people's lives a little better. How you doing? Good, you? Yeah. Watch that post. Good. <laughs> I was born in a, in a small French community called Chapleau, Ontario, up in northern Ontario. My, uh, my dad wasn't well after he came back from the war. And consequently, I got out and started work and I was 13 years old. And I helped to raise the rest of the, my siblings. I helped to raise the rest of my siblings the best that I could. I worked on a farm till I was 15, till I was old enough to get a job working in a factory. But I've always been the type of a person that's a survival. I've always been a survivor. And I've never been out of work in my life. I worked at Holmes Foundry when I came here to Sarnia. And last 20 some years, I worked at Imperial Oil and retired from them. I married a girl from uh, the town of Petrolia, Ontario, which is about 14, 15 miles from here. I met her on a blind date. The second week after I went with her, I asked her for her hand in marriage. And we've been married 40 years. What? Oh, excuse me a minute. I forgot to bring a bag. You have to forgive me. Come on, let's go. You'll have to forgive me. My knees are bothering me today. Pretty good. How are you doing? I fell about 13 and a half feet off of a off a ladder working at Imperial Oil in 1978 or 1980. I can't remember what year it was. Come on. And I continue to keep working too. And I had my shoulder all rebuilt, my lower part of my back, my 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 whole right side of my my body was damaged from from the fall. Hi Sylvia, how are you doing? All right. 
I want you to tell her yeah. about how Bill suffered yeah. from occupational diseases. This was one of the things I've tried to prosecute companies like Imperial Oil, Dow, Shell. I'm the one who's had the guts enough to take on these companies. And here's an example of somebody that now is alone because of her husband working with asbestos all of his life and breathing, breathing in all these hydrocarbons, all these different gases and everything. Yeah, I guess he knew he had asbestosis to build up because yeah. with you telling him to go, it would, uh, what would have gone six years ago? Yeah. And he knew the asbestos, I mean the calcium was, the build up was there. Yeah. Asbestos, but not, it had not triggered till, uh, not long before he died, no. Well, I got another friend right now. I'm taking down to the cancer hospital right now mm -hmm. in London, eh? And he worked, at Dow, he worked at Dow Chemical. Yeah. You probably know it traveled to his bones and yeah. then the liver. Yeah. The lung, the bones, the liver. And the man next door, he was, no, he's an electrician, but he died of uh, liver cancer a lot younger than See? Bill, 61. Yeah, and my neighbor across the street from me, he was only 52. And he started bleeding, uh, you know, uh, and then they rushed him by air ambulance to London. He just died the other day. Brought him to the hospital and he died. Bill would know when it started at yeah. work that um, in six months they'd be gone. Oh, I know them all. Over I worked with them all. Year after year after year. Yeah. Are you ready? Ready to go for a run? Go! There they go. Come on, Cleo, let's go home. Yeah. Wayne got sick in um, 2002. And then, of course, I told you before, my other brother-in-law and my sister, who got sick in November that year. My girlfriend's husband got sick December that year. My sister's husband was diagnosed with stomach and bowel cancer in 2002. He died in July 2003. My girlfriend's husband had a multi-organ shutdown and diagnosed with bladder cancer. He died a week before my brother -in -law. And then Pat's wife, Carol, what year was that, Pat? Uh, about three years ago. Three years ago? So when Wayne was still sick, um, she ended up with breast cancer. Sammy and I are sister and brother-in-law. We, we married into the family. <laughs> she was married to my wife's brother. Yeah, there's lots of cancer in Sarnia. It's a big industry here. Almost as big as a petrochemical. At the age of about seven, I, I got to learn something about it. I didn't understand what I was learning at the time, but I did later. We used to play at a creek and uh, down by the railroad tracks. It was kind of our playground. We had rafts on it and there was wild, you know, like crayfish and whatever in the, in the water. So it was probably a fairly healthy thing to do from the outside. Well, one day a little Italian kid threw a match in the creek and it caught fire. So years later, when I was a teenager, I decided to follow it to see where it went. Well, the creek went right into Ontario Oil. They dumped something into a creek without taking any consideration as to where it went. And there's children playing there. There were quite a few of us there that day. I remember being younger myself, and every day they had a spill in the river. And so you're like, okay, well, I, I, I suppose that's not good, but they know what they're doing. And so again, they use rust, right? And at night, lots of times, the uh, guys would talk about the releases they let out at night, too. So when I was to an allergist in London, because I became so ill, he's like, don't sleep with your windows open. And you're always taught to, you know, fresh air, it's good for you, right? Well, he said, well, they releases from the plants. And mostly it happens at night. Imperial Oil especially was really good at, we're going to educate your family, we will give you a good job. So they have really sold the mindset into these people. We all bought into it. <laughs> well, 
The chemical plants are what keeps Sarnia prosperous, but there's a price to pay for that. The price is I have one less mom. She has no husband. It's quite a price. It's quite common down here to have mysterious stuff on your porches, on your house, or on your windows. You know, one time we were meeting with Imperial Oil, and I had said there was some black stuff all over my front porch. So they came down and had some little metal sticky stuff, took about four samples. They went and uh, analyzed it, and they said there was, I believe, hydrocarbons or something in there, and then regular dirt. Mm -hmm. Then I noticed my porch was all black. I called Shell, which is directly south of me. They came over, took a sample in a baggie or an envelope, to have it analyzed, and they said they weren't sure if that was enough to get a sample. I said, Jesus, Imperial Oil took little wee things, and they told me what was in it. And then I called Suncor, too. Suncor is the north of me, so I wasn't sure which way the wind was blowing. They came over, and they just said, well, we'll have to see which way the wind's blowing first. What would make me feel better is to actually have the Ministry of Environment or plus ourselves test and compare results and see what it is. Because I, it was never this black before and my furniture never looked black like that. Well, we have, you know, nurses and doctors and industrial hygienists and researchers and we've had er ergonomists that work on you know work design issues we're committed to the population at risk that's why we're here we try to help them with their health problems we try to prevent cancer and other diseases we try to provide them with information if they do get these diseases we try to see if there's an association so you know we we have a position. We, we take, we're on the side of, of the workers and the people that, that live here. And uh, so the corporations, they, they see that as against their interest. This is a, a bunch of articles here that was on mesothelioma that was done in the Globe and Mail about, as it says, Sarnia's nightmare hits thousands. We're like a ground zero. You know, we know that the petrochemical industry, you know, tried to get the clinic closed. Uh, we know that the employers, you know, after the article on Blaine Kennard and, and the asbestos here came out, they were publicly attacking us, uh, the construction association, for instance, in town. These file drawers here are full of articles, you know, on all kinds of boxes full of file folders. Industry sees us as on the other side, and I think that if they see workers in the community is on the other side, we're definitely on the other side. I remember my dad used to take us down to see the Christmas lights. They'd take all the towers and uh, change all the white lights to the colored lights, and it was always like fairyland down there. In our age group, go to high school, get out of school, and jobs were pretty available in the plants. And so that's where most of the kids went to work at a young age. Blaine got to be a summer student at Holmes Foundry, 
And when we were married, he went to work at Well and Chemicals. And he worked there for, I believe it was about 25 years. We went to primary grades together. And in grade five, I fell in love with him. And then he moved away. Of course, I being devastated, thinking I'd never see him again. And when I was 18, on a Sunday afternoon, a mutual friend came by and said, come on, let's go for a ride. And I go out to get in the car, and Blaine was in the back seat. And uh, we had a really good life. And now that's all changed. So outside Well and Chemical, and you can see it's pretty darn derelict. This at one time was, believe it or not, the world's largest producing chloride company in the world, employing some 35 men. The men worked hard. It was a dirty job. Some of them have died, and uh, it's a pretty sad story. I was always a, you know, little stay-home housewife, went out to work, and not one for speaking out and doing a lot of things, but I found myself becoming more and more outspoken. I met a widow once who said, oh, I don't tell anybody that my husband's ill. I said, sweetheart, you tell everybody. Are the men angry that you speak out? Yes. I think as children, we have these um, ideas. I don't know what young men think, but young girls will think, oh, I'll get married, I'll find the perfect man, and I'll have this little house, the picket fence, the flowers, the children, the dog, and the cat. And then as you grow older, you realize that's not the real picture. <laughs> But in that picture, that man was always there. He was in good shape. He was very, very strong. He was climbing this tower, and he came home that night, and he said, uh, I got really short of breath. I had to stop climbing. I couldn't breathe. And I said, well, maybe we should see a doctor. And he said, oh, no, no, I haven't been working for a while, so I need to stay. And it was in November that they finally called it what it was. It was mesothelioma. When we pressed a doctor, he said, get your things in order. And, you know, we're like, well, what are we looking at here? He said, maybe four months, if you're lucky. I'm angry for a lot of different reasons. Angry that, you know, the companies have stolen the rest of my life away. They've taken the man that I have loved forever away from me, but it doesn't touch them. It doesn't touch these men who sit in their little towers and don't have to work in the product. For a while there, the only thing he could do was shave half his face because it was too exhausting for him to shave his whole face. You know, to get up from one room to the other. That was the job of the day. My husband said to me, I understand, once a man, twice a child. Your respirator is your best friend. If you were uh, required to weld, then you would be able to put your welding shield on here like this. And then there, you would have the access to do this with your welding shield and this particular product here is going to cost you almost a thousand dollars in the production of the petrochemical industry you have uh, the lean sisters benzene toluene xylene those are all carcinogens which uh, you don't really want to come in contact with there's um, h2s which is uh, hydrogen sulfide which is uh, can kill you at a very low parts per million, I think at 700 parts per million. If you wear this when you go to work and you put this on when you left the lunchroom, uh, you would eliminate a huge amount of potential for being exposed to carcinogens, which have typically harmed the, uh, the people in our industry and caused a, a short lifespan if you're not careful. This is my uh, brother Blair Allen. He uh, is the instructor for the Boilermakers right now, he's the one that I was uh, talking about that teaches all the safety stuff to all the new members. I think uh, if you worked for Shell Oil, uh, 
your, your best interest would be to do your job as efficient as possible. I don't think that anybody who works for any industrial uh, institution goes to work and says, I'm not going to do my job efficiently today. And if somebody gets exposed to something, it, I don't care. I, that's not their attitude because it's a small community here. Everybody's, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's the land of the six toed sandal too loudly, but everybody knows everybody in this community. Education is something which has come with over time. No fault of anybody who worked at an oil refinery, but I don't think uh, GM was mandated to put seat belts or airbags in cars until the federal legislation went in. So what would make an oil refinery any different than, than a car manufacturer? I've lost a lot of friends who died early because of the occupational disease and illness down here. Um, but again, things have got better. People are more aware of it. Education has got to be a, a big thing down here now, the, the health and safety. And uh, uh, here with my, my own trade union, uh, the Boilermakers, they're taking, uh, they're not being reactive, they're being proactive into the education. The refineries are understanding that, or, and the companies around here, they're understanding that there are health concerns and, and that people are trying to make it better, and they're trying to make it better. It's not all their fault. A lot of it is just the way we were. You know, when you had a job, you didn't question it because you kept your job. Uh, you know, put head down, ass up, you know, uh, uh, get your work done and get your paycheck and go home. That's the way it was. Sorry, I, the fast food and the french fry wagons are basically known to the world. And uh, I, have be, I happen to be one of, the, one of them. They come from the States, they come from Toronto, they come from all over the place. They used to be a place for um, 67 years old. <laughs> so I retired. I've done nothing but work. That's all I know is work. I've worked seven days a week, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Just about ready to uh, call quits pretty soon. Learn a lot from him. He's one of my best friends in the city, so without him, I wouldn't be lost. I got a separation, and then I was, I was alone all the time. And I met Roger, and he helped me through it. That's what friends are for. And believe me, he is a friend. <laughs> we help each other, and he helps me in a lot of ways, and I try to help him a lot of ways. He's just a super guy. <laughs> Somebody to know. And he does have the best fries. could hear the gurgling of the fluid in his lung. And if I rubbed his back, I would make it worse. I can hear it's literally splashing. If you don't know that you got something wrong with you when you're doing that, then you have no hope of surviving. When he went into the surgery, she had told us that the one tumor was laying on his aorta. And if there was no fat between the aorta and the tumor, that they would just yeah, close, they would, would just be, put everything back and they would close them up and that no. would be all that they could do. No, I went into surgery with knowing that. I suppressed my feelings quite a bit. I didn't want her any more upset than she was. I was just as scared as she was. He'd had um, fluid on the lung and Dr. Valachandra first trained a leader and then about three weeks later trained another three, a leader and a half off. And then um, they did a biopsy. They did CAT scans, they did MRIs. And um, with the biopsy, Belichanda told us that we had, that he had lung cancer. They hadn't got the definite results back to say whether it was just lung cancer or meso. And two weeks later, we were already seeing um, the, can the oncologist here. And uh, that's when we got the diagnosis for that he had meso. In my involvement with the union, with the executive board, one of the things we do is we go to all the funerals. 
and I've seen a lot of people die from asbestos, but I've never to this day met anybody who survived it. I know they're out there, but I've never met anybody. So for me to be diagnosed was a death, like it was a death sentence. I had watched my brother die. It was very painful. Um, I thought, here I am. I was 56 years old. And I thought I was going to lose my husband. I thought <laughs> all our plans for retirement were come and gone. <laughs> so we just put our blinders on and we said, go for it. We'll do whatever we can. When the doctor here in Sarnia said he was going to put me on a palliative program, I, I lost my temper. And I told him what I thought of palliative is to give up. I wasn't ready to give up. So I said, if you got any way to save my life, I really appreciate it. That's what you did. I don't have a death wish and I don't give up easily. The first chemo was, like I said, he lost, went from 160 to 134 in one week. The, the, um, that was right. The projectile vomiting was, was scary. And he's a very um, independent man and really didn't want a lot of help. So I did a lot of sitting at the top of the stairs crying because he wouldn't allow me to help. Well, so they give him... You did help. I wouldn't have got through without you. Because the one tumor was laying on the aorta and the other one was kind of at the bottom of his lung, his lung was abnormally long so they had to actually make two incisions. And this is where they removed the fifth rib. And this is where they couldn't detach the lower lung where the tumor was. So they've got another incision here so they could remove the whole lung. The pathology report showed everything was contained in the pleural plaque. Nothing had made the lymph node in the lung. Uh, it hadn't spread. Um, the, uh, the, the chemo doctor, the radiation doctor, and the surgeon are all in agreement that everything looks good. It looks like a I'm clear of it. I, I was a hothead as a young person. I had a bad temper. And uh, I uh, learned to control it. So at my age now, 60 years old, um, yes, I'm just as angry, but I control it. There is really no point in my mind in uh, blowing up and yelling and screaming. It, it's not a constructive thing to do. What do you see when you look straight ahead? The refinery. Where are these homes? Right at the gate. This is what you expect to see in a third world country. 
but it's right here. People live that close to the refineries here. We're that interlinked with them. Do I want to leave this earth as just some guy that worked in the, in the valley and got sick and died? No, I don't. The problem is, it, it is everybody is so tapped into this area, it's hard to just say, well, you know what, I can't, for my own health, I have to leave. This is where people make their living now. This is their livelihood. It's like in the old days when you owed your soul to the company store for the coal miners. That's what you did. It wasn't the safest job around, but that's where you worked and what you did. If I'm going into a, a vessel to do work in there and I'm gonna get poisoned, tell me, let me make that choice. I've already made that choice by entering your gate. Maybe the choice would be to like organize mass strikes and they don't want that. Nobody really wants that. Everybody wants to work together. Uh, we just need a little more trust. I grew up around little volunteer fire departments and stuff, and uh, a lot of the guys don't know just how involved I had been beforehand. And uh, finally, I was getting enough work around town that I could stay at home, so I chose to join, because I like helping my community. I like to help everybody. I'm a family man. I enjoy having a family. Uh, I have a beautiful wife, and uh, I had three boys, and, and now I have a, a new baby girl. In uh, 1989, our firstborn son uh, was born premature, and we feel it was due to uh, Jane at the time was working one of the refineries and uh, had been a toxic vapor release. So she may have been exposed to some of the chemical during the release. After uh, our son died, we still had a loving, caring relationship and we wanted to help other kids. So we started fostering for children's aid and um, we actually adopted our son, Donovan. I've told the boys, you know, I don't care what you are when you grow up, just enjoy doing what you do. Some days I feel bad because I can't give my family all the things that maybe they deserve because um, I'm not employed as much as I could be or should be. Uh, with the economic times, uh, work situation is very low. We kind of rely on the industry, so we're not out to try and uh, make things tough for them economically. Myself? I don't know. Uh, just a man who sometimes tries hard not to be so angry about uh, maybe what life has dealt me, but that's what it has and that's what I have to live with. When you're on the job, uh, you're given your task and you go and do it. You do it together. Most soldiers don't do anything on their own. They follow commands. And that's what you do on the job. You have someone that leads the way. Uh, we have general foremans who uh, determine what jobs are gonna be done and when, and they hand it down to the foremans who disperse it to the men. So it's just like following the chain of command in the army. When I'm fighting a fire, I fight the fire because that's what I do. Uh, I may or may not come home. And I know that, and I accept that risk. Same with working in the industry. Uh, they pay me a lot of money, and I may or may not come home. Me and Johnny have probably torn apart five or six pianos. These are from the bottom posts of street lights. I find them loose sometimes, and they're fun to submerge in water. You can make weird noises. And also the bedpan guitar, which I call the Elvis. It's nice, you can put water in there and sort of uh, move it around and make all sorts of weird noises. 
This is where we keep all the drums. One of my new favorites are those. Show them how uh, like, noisy they are. Sounds sort of nice. And this is a section of an old furnace. But this is sort of uh, the workshop of painting and building several other instruments. All sorts of strange stuff here. The idea of finding garbage, essentially, or things that would be considered worthless, and finding worth in that is like a beautiful thing to me. People will go to a store and spend $300 on a beautiful symbol where I'd prefer this cracked and broken thing like that. Like, to me, that sounds beautiful, and it's garbage. Just the idea of worthlessness found objects that have been sort of deteriorated by nature. I feel like there's a, such a beauty in it. There's no influence and the hand of man has nothing to do with it, essentially. These ancient things and these pieces of garbage, they were like, to me, a reflection of time and a reflection of meditation and just all these different things. I feel like that's why there's an abundance of it on the curb because it's trash. What's going on here is not unique to Sarnia. This is a dynamic that's playing out the whole social fabric of the country. People are living with enormous insecurities, enormous pressures. The jobs are going. Maybe the petrochemical industry in its current form is gone anyway. If we're not actors in our own history, then we tend to be victimized, we tend to be exploited. Like, why can't the economy serve the average person? Why does it always have to serve the people on Dow Street or Bay Street or the corporate class? I mean, there's other players here. We're not dummies. I was a product of the 1960s. I was an activist in the anti-war movement. I came to Canada partly out of my disgust over racism in the United States. Um, over, you know, the war, of course. And I guess my life's work has been, you know, as a, as a, as a community organizer. Uh, and, you know, I kind of made a preferential option, if you will, uh, you know, to devote myself to the problems that working class and poor people have. One of the reasons that I gravitated to, to them and to their issue, besides the harm I saw it was causing and the horrible injustice of seeing people in their 30s dying of cancer that was totally preventable, was that even among the most conservative workers, there would be an agreement that the reason that workers get sick at work is because they have no say over who tells, you know, who tells whom to do what under what conditions. And so the health and safety issue carried with it the seeds of a, you know, a much more critical analysis of, of capitalism, of our society in general, all of its injustices and so on and so forth. I think now the, the current union leadership, not in all the unions, but in the major industrial unions, seems to be almost at a cul-de-sac. You know, if it, if it can't find 
another way of looking at this crisis other than through the lens of the employers, then I think that there's very little chance that something of, of a, a, a profound nature will emerge out of this. I don't want to fantasize too much here and say social movements create utopias. They don't. But I don't think the status quo, it's either the status quo or nothing. I don't think I have the wherewithal to plan the economy and what it should look like. But I have tremendous faith that if people were given an opportunity and real supports that we could create something quite different and healthier than what we got. And that's a long historical process and the only way we get there is we gotta walk there, no free ride. We've taken ourselves from being a one-trick pony, a chemical industry only, and diversified. Everything from gaming to power generation uh, to ethanol fuels. If you don't have business and labor working together, your community won't work. So what we've done is recognize that we have some strength with the chemical industry, but we've moved it in the new direction. And we've moved in a direction which will lead to, we believe, a thousand new jobs here in the next three to four years. This was the former Dow Chemical Canada headquarters, and they were slowly disappearing from Canada. So politically, there was a huge risk to come forward and spend that type of money. But since then, that risk has been ratified by the number of jobs that have been created here, over 3,000 people working here, and a number more to come, and hundreds and hundreds in the years ahead. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> We've got 750 production seats here that we service. It will be servicing five different accounts, right from uh, cell phone companies to landline companies to electronic companies and also uh, uh, we service energy companies as well take a look you'll see a lot of individuality so you know from one group to the other and what we're trying to do is really these people become the employee of our vendor you know it does get pretty tiring to be on the phones for eight hours so what we try to do you know add some fun into it so we have different decorating contests different, you know, in order to get incentives you get them lunches you get the different prizes and everything just to keep that fresh and going on from there how much do people earn our uh, you know they start at ten dollars an hour but they can earn as much as 15 or 16 or 17 depending on that automatically we include a 50 dollar adherence bonus so if you come work every one of your shifts you get an extra 50 cents an hour you know, and then we go annual raises on top of that, but then each program has their own bonus program that they can earn, depending on, you know, pay for performance kind of thing, so, yeah. People sometimes can uh, disparage call centers. We were very specific on the ones that we wanted. They were incoming calls, and they were high quality. That's why yeah. you're still expanding. While the Absolutely. economy has been sliding, our call centers have actually been developing and expanding. This place, though, really does, to me, feel like a strange place. I don't know if, if it's any different than anywhere else, but uh, maybe just the whole world is a strange place. Since I was a child, I guess, I've always kind of felt out of place like that, even in public school. And then ever since then, I've just been drawn to people who maybe don't quite fit in and uh, just sort of the outside parts of society. I just notice a lot of anger in this city, and maybe it's just a lot of anger in the heart of man wherever you go, but uh, because most of my experience has only been here, I tend to equate it with this town, and I don't really know exactly 
where it comes from. I think a, a lot of it maybe just comes from people distracting themselves and just trying to fill their time. What's the difference between wasting a life and spending a life? That's a pretty interesting question and a difficult one too, I think. The industry, the oil refineries, that's kind of the heart of what has created this society. If that industry was to be gone tomorrow or to deteriorate or whatever, I don't know that this city would really survive or not. I can't see that industry being around even, you know, or at least being that powerful, you know, 100 years from now. My job is a big part of my life. That's why we, we live here. So I could see losing that. I simply couldn't do it anymore. I started by getting a summer helper's job in Imperial Oil. Um, did that for two years and uh, pretty much made up my mind from what I saw there. The income was good. Uh, I did enjoy the work. As far as why anybody works is to improve your lot in life. And most certainly the more you want in life, the more you have to work for it. It's not a free ride. Hey, if you're happy with your job and you're getting a decent wage, that's the best combination you can ever get. The only downside of it is getting muscle. In this town, because I was raised here, it was pretty much a given. If you're going to work in construction here, you're going to work in the plants. It's almost all heavy industry. So in the bulk of my career, that's what I've been doing. You go on a site and there's nothing there. And if you stay for the duration, when you leave, something has been built. And it's usually something pretty impressive. And I, I have worked on computer in an office. I did that for six months. And to be honest with you, I didn't like it. I was gaining weight. I was getting unhealthy from it. And I just plain, I prefer to work with my hands. Uh, so what does it mean to be working class? To me, it means contributing in a way that you can actually see uh, if you're working at a desk with paperwork, shuffling paper all the time, I, I think it'd be difficult to see the results of your efforts. You're busy, but I don't think it'd be quite as easy for them as it is for me, because like I said, I can start with a green field, and when it's done, it's something complete that wasn't there before. It's, it's to me, I got a lot of pride in what I did. I enjoyed it. I had pride in it. I could look back on it. I can take my grandchildren 
to plants that I've worked on that, that I helped build and tell them what I did at these plants. Like, it's something to be proud of. Well, the last four years before he got sick, he worked six or seven days a week, 10 hours a day, 10 to 12 hours a day. And when I was sick, I made him, I said, look, I need you on Sunday, at least on Sunday. Yeah. Can you tell me the story of how you met? Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give her a In the gym at St. Clair High School, yeah. where we both went to school, and we had been collecting fun, like, we, we were going... Going door we to door, going collecting, door to door, collecting money for Centennial, so they could build Centennial Park down by the river. And we were bringing mm -hmm. our... Our, the money that we had collected back, and we kind of met there, but we didn't. We didn't date for what, what three years? Two and a half years. But if we were at a dance at the same time, we were always together. She's everything. Everything that I really enjoy in life is because of her. I didn't know what I was going to do if I would have lost him. We've been together a long. It's 6.45 on the early shift. In the marketplace, as in combat, trust is about knowing and obeying the rules. As it turns out, our top soldiers fighting wars that aren't games at all are quite comfortable with this parallel. Now he's the commandant of the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. We're, in fact, we're asking our people to work in situations where they have to put their lives at risk and some people will die. As a boilermaker, I don't do the same thing every day. We repair a lot of the uh, towers, the heat exchangers, uh, the tanks and vessels that you see. I work with little tools and I work with huge tools. If I said to you I'm using a four-inch socket, 
Like, that's just huge. Or I work with a 500-ton crane. You know, it's just, it's like being a kid in a, one huge sandbox. Not something everybody will do. Sometimes, though, you get on uh, shutdowns where you might be doing six days a week, 10-hour days, maybe seven days a week. Uh, some of the younger guys like doing the 12 and 14-hour days. Uh, sure, the money's good, but boy, are you ever tired, and you've got no life when you're doing that. When I'm not working, I go down, I put my name on a list, and then uh, companies uh, like the company I work for, uh, when they need men, they call the union hall. They'll say, well, I need 20 boilermakers. So he goes down the list, and they start making phone calls. And if I happen to be number 18, I'll get a call. Being a boilermaker is um, uh, yeah, it's a little hard to describe. We call it a brotherhood. And it's uh, you know a bunch of... Uh, men and women from all walks of life, but we work together as a unit. Doesn't matter how spread out the world is, we are all one community, and we need to be helping each other. It's just nobody's got the courage to stand up and say that. Uh, everybody's got their own agendas, or they're trying to have power. This career sort of opened up to me, and so I just sort of went through it, through that door. Being in those places, it's like another world. You can hardly even move, and you can hardly see, and I sort of really appreciate it in some way. It's like sort of being in the womb of like some sort of mechanical beast or something. There's almost a strange comfort to it. Spill your 
into mysterious wells That's the hand that I was dealt And all the splendid ancestry It's gonna be the end of me Take my hand and lie to me Tell me it's a lucky old crown Take my hand and lie to me Tell me we're not going down Some will be taken Some will be spared This little song And was running scared Oh, the tides are 